Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from around the world. My name is Sabrina Welsh, and I'm the Director of Programs and Operations at the Human Vaccines Project, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. As of this week, there are over 35 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. As of Tuesday morning, at least 1,044,100 people have died, and the virus has been detected in nearly every country. The coronavirus pandemic is ebbing in some of the countries that were hit hardest early on, but the number of new cases is growing faster than ever worldwide, with more than 200,000 cases reported each day on average. In the vaccine field, additional candidates have progressed to phase three trials, including vaccines from J&J &J and Novavax. And there's an upcoming meeting um, with the FDA on October 22nd that I think will interest many of you. The FDA just released a briefing document in advance of the meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Project Products Advisory Committee, which is meeting to discuss the development, authorization, and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. We've decided to postpone our next lab meeting, um, which was scheduled on October 22nd to October 29th, given that our team, and I imagine many of you, want to attend the FDA meeting. We'll send out a revised meeting invite later today for the rescheduled meeting on the 29th, so be sure to look out for that. And just a note before we begin, the information presented today includes some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. At the request of the author, we ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented. The session will be recorded and available on our website and our social media channels for you to review. Today's speaker is Dr. Emmanuel Andriano from Toscana Life Sciences. Dr. Andriano received his PhD at the University of Siena, working with GSK Vaccine Siena. During this period, he gained extensive experience on single cell sorting of antigen specific memory B cells and isolation, cloning, expression, and functional and structural characterization of human monoclonal antibodies. I'm sorry, it just got really dark in here. <laughs> it just went out. This experience has been used to unravel the functional antibody repertoire against the RSV fusion protein in healthy and vaccinated donors. Dr. Andriano is currently a European Research Council postdoctoral fellow within the research group led by Dr. Rina Rapuli at the Toscana Life Sciences Foundation in Siena. Here, he works on the isolation of human monoclonal antibodies against viral and bacterial pathogens with a particular focus on SARS-CoV-2 and N. gonorrhea. The aim of his postdoc is to fight global threats for human health, such as emerging infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance. In today's lab meeting, Dr. Andriano is going to talk about potent human monoclonal antibody responses against SARS-CoV-2. During the, ple the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'll ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after he's finished the presentation. And we'll have about 25 minutes for discussion, so I hope you'll take the opportunity to ask your questions about the data presented today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emmanuel Andriano from Toscana Life Sciences. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Sabrina, for the introduction. So, Thank you for joining us. If you can go ahead and share your screen, so, I will uh, turn it over to you. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So first of all, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the whole Human Vaccine Project organization, Sabrina, Daphne, for organizing this fantastic meeting and for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, for the whole monoclonal antibody discovery lab based in Siena at Fondazione Toscana Life Sciences. And today I will be honored to share with you the data that we have produced during these pandemics and this presentation called Extremely Potent Human Monoclonal Antibodies Against SARS-CoV-2. So before starting and going deeply into the COVID project part, I would like to quickly introduce our laboratory, uh, which is called Monoclonal Antibody Discovery, as I said, or Mad Lab, as we like to call it. Uh, it is started in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, and we were mainly three people that you can see here, Dr. Rina Rapoli on the left, myself, and Dr. Claudia Sala, and also our very first PhD student, Marco Treisi, that wasn't in this picture. And from that, as you can see on the list on your right, uh, we grow extensively and we are now 17 people in our laboratory. The, the lab is, uh, as I say, led by Dr. Rina Rapoli, uh, 
as and many of you might know him, he's a world leader scientist in the vaccinology microbiology field. And the main goal of our laboratory is to fight one of the biggest threats for human health of our time, which is uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Indeed, it is estimated that uh, over 10 million people uh, will die because of antimicrobial resistance by 2050, which can be translated in a death to AMR every three seconds. This, is what, this will not be just uh, uh, important as a public health concern. It will not just be a, a public health concern, but it will, also be, uh, it will also have an important impact as we are currently living with the, the COVID-19 pandemics on the global economic system. Indeed, it is estimated that there will be a gross domestic product loss of around $100 trillion. Our laboratory uh, has three main projects right now. It focuses on Neisseria gonorrhea uh, that has been funded, the project has been funded by the European Research Council, uh, Shigala species, and this project has been funded by the Wellcome Trust and Glepsiella pneumonia, and this project has been funded by the uh, Tuscany region. How do we intend to fight antimicrobial resistance? Uh, through the use of monoclonal antibody for both therapy, prophylaxis, and vaccine acceleration. Why so? Well, Human monoclonal antibodies can be nowadays, uh, as it has been demonstrated for the COVID-19 pandemics, quickly isolated from patients that have been exposed to the infection. And once you have identified your promising candidates, your promising nubs, this can be quickly developed uh, through very well established procedure. And once you have your therapeutic antibody, you can quickly go into the preclinical phase to have the whole package that can bring you to the clinical development phases and then quickly go into licensing and commercialization of the product. While if you think about, about uh, the vaccine development pipeline, this is different as it is way much, it is much longer. Indeed, once you have identified your targeted antigens, then it will take several years before you characterize the antigen and then decide the proper way for expressing the antigen, establish all the protocols necessary for its development, scale up, and GMP procedures. And then you can go ahead and go with uh, your preclinical package, clinical package, and commercial licensing and commercialization. But if we take uh, advantage of the knowledge that you acquire while developing human monoclonal antibodies in the preclinical clinical phase, you can use this knowledge at your advantage to accelerate also the development of new vaccines. And this is why we would like to use monoclonal antibodies to fight AMR. This is a schematic representation of the workflow that we have implemented for uh, this. And basically what we do is to uh, collect blood from infected and vaccinated people to isolate, C, uh, to isolate B cells specific for, for our pathogens. Then we take this B cell and keep them in culture for two weeks. They will naturally produce antibodies. And then once we have identified those that are specific for the pathogen of interest, we will use them for functional screening. The functional screening will be uh, done by using a new tool, which is called the Opera Phoenix. This is a high throughput confocal microscope, which is implemented with machine learning and, and artificial intelligence approaches. It will allow us to discriminate hundreds of pictures with all the contents that they contain in order to identify potential uh, antibodies that are able to kill, uh, inhibit adhesion, internalization, and bacterial growth. Once we have identified the antibody of interest, this will be a use in an agnostic fashion to identify the antigen that lead to the protection. And this will be used for uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies development as well as vaccine development and start exploratory clinical trials. So this is the brief introduction of the MAD lab. But since the beginning of this year, as uh, other labs in the world, we all stopped and moved from fighting AMR to fighting the COVID-19 pandemics. And this is a picture that has been taken while we were painstakingly working on the SARS-CoV-2 project. So uh, here is another uh, workflow. It's another schematic representation of the workflow that has been implemented to reach this goal, uh, to isolate and identify extremely potent human monoclonal antibodies. So we uh, collected uh, the blood from 14 COVID-19 convalescent patients that survived to the infection. Then we performed single cell sorting on the memory B cells that have been laid over a bed of feeder cells and incubated with stimuli in order to let them naturally produce and release monoclonal antibodies in the supernatant. 
then these antibodies have been tested in order to see which one of those were capable to bind the spike protein or some domain of the spike proteins. And then they've been all tested for neutralization uh, in vitro against the authentic virus. All the neutralizing antibodies then have been uh, deep, deeply characterized in order also to recognize different regions of neutralization on the surface of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein. Once we identified the most interesting antibodies, the uh, heavy and light chain sequences amplicons have been retrieved, analyzed, and some of the antibodies have been also um, mutated in order to extend their half-life and to abrogate the FC gamma receptor binding. The most interesting antibodies that have been selected for cryo-EM resolution in order to solve the structure and to identify the epitope to which they are recognized. And finally, the, the best candidate has been used for prophylactic as well as therapeutic intervention in animal challenge in serum hamsters. For the sake of this presentation, I will just talk about the phase one and phase two. And here there are two preprints that have been sent out. The first one, the 8th of May 2020, and the other one just got uh, released today. So as I said, the first step was to isolate, to collect the blood from this uh, con convalescent patient that survived the COVID-19 infection. We got two collaborators, two collaborators, uh, the hospital in uh, Siena, Policlinico Lescotte, as well as the National Institute of Infectious Disease, Lazzaro Spallanzani in Rome. Uh, they provided us the blood samples that has been used to isolate memory B cells specific for the spike protein. And this is here on the right, it is the um, gating strategy that has been used to isolate these cells. And over 4,200 and up to 4,277 uh, 4, S protein specific memory B cell have been isolated. Then they all been tested for their binding ability towards the S protein trimer. And as you can see here in the graph, a thousand of antibody have been tested and here they are divided by single subject that have been analyzed in the study and over 1700 S protein specific monoclonal antibody have been identified. Then all of the antibody have been tested for their ability to neutralize the binding between the spike protein and the receptor on the surface of very sick cells. So basically monoclonal antibodies have been co-incubated with fluorescently labeled S protein if the antibody wasn't able to neutralize, as you can see here on the top of, the, of this figure, if they were not able to neutralize the binding between the, the uh, fluorescent label spike protein and the receptor, we will have seen a signal. While if they were able to neutralize the binding, we wouldn't see a signal. What we observed is that among the 1700 uh, monoclonal antibodies specific for the spike protein, around 70% of these were able to neutralize this binding. Then all the antibodies being tested for their ability to neutralize the virus in vitro against the authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, monoclonal antibodies selected together with the SARS-CoV-2 were co-incubated. And then we use a cytopathic effect based assay, uh, neutralization assay to assess the neutralization activity. So here on the left of this slide, you will see neutralizing antibody here. So if they neutralize the virus, you will see a layer of feeder set that remain intact as it is for this representative image that you can see here. Uh, while on the other end, if the antibody is not neutralizing, then the uh, layer of feeder cell will be disrupted and you will see the cytopathic, the cytopathic effect as it is represented here in this image. So, all the antibodies have been tested, all the spike protein specific antibody have been tested for the neutralization activity in vivo, in vitro, sorry. And as you can see here, the vast majority of antibodies were not neutralizing, 73.8%, and roughly 10% and 16% of the antibody were partially neutralizing, uh, therefore able to partially protect the layer of feeder cell, or completely neutralizing, therefore able to completely protect the layer of feeder cells. This led us to the identification of over 450 neutralizing antibodies. Then we checked their binding specificity towards the S1 domain, S2 domain, or the S protein trimer, because there are some antibodies that were not able to bind the single domain, but just a spike protein in its trimeric conformation. As you can see, the majority of the neutralizing antibodies are specific to the S1 domain, 57.5%.
and the second po the, the second biggest population on antibodies that recognizes spike protein trimer, so uh, with 35.2%, and very few of them, 7%, did recognize the S2 domain. Then all of these antibodies, we try to recover the heavy and light chain sequences for their expression, and we managed to express 220 neutralizing antibodies. As you can see from the, the slides here on top, uh, the figure here on top, sorry, which shows the neutralization potency of these neutralizing antibodies, the vast majority did neutralize, they were weakly neutralizing, neutralizing from 500 nanogram ml or above. And only three of them showed to have extremely potent neutralization potency, which is less than 10 nanogram ml. The graph below, the bar charts, shows you the distribution of neutralizing antibodies for each donor. And overall, we see that the majority of antibodies are weakly neutralizing, 65.9%. Uh, then the second biggest population are antibodies that are medium neutralizing, 23.6, highly neutralizing, roughly, nine, roughly 10%, and only 1% of the antibody are extremely neutralizing. Therefore, with a neutralization potency of less of 10 nanogram ml. Then we selected 14 of these antibodies for deeper characterization. The first thing that we did was to check again their binding, specific, their binding specificity. As you can see in the figure A, all the antibodies do bind the spike trimer, the spike trimer protein. Then in the figure B, as you can see, there are just the antibodies in, green, in, uh, in dark red and in pink that bind the S1, specifically the S1 domain. And as you can see there in the, in the C figure, uh, only one antibody of these selected were specific for the S2 domain. Then we assess the neutralization potency, and these are the, the, the IC100, the neutralization curve that you can see here, against both the wild type 1 strain as well as the D614G uh, uh, strain. The graph phi F and G shows you the antibodies grouped for their binding specificity, where in the dark red show antibody that are able to neutralize the virus with a, an IC uh, 100 of less than 10 nanogram ml, and these are the S1 RBD antibodies. Then you see the population antibodies that bind, that bind the S1 domain, but not the RBD. Then in, in blue, you see antibodies that bind specifically the S2 domain. And then in gray, you see antibodies that bind the S protein only in its trimeric conformation. And as you can see, extremely potent antibodies are, have been identified only in the group of S1 RBT. Then in order to speculate on the neutralization and neutralizing region that, rec that these antibodies recognize on the spike protein, a competition assay has been implemented. This is a, a bead that you can see uh, in the middle and to this bead, they were attached to the spike protein. If the antibodies, so the first thing was to incubate the beads with the spike protein with a, a, a primary unlabeled monoclonal antibody, and then a secondary labeled monoclonal antibody directed towards the spike protein was used. If the secondary labeled antibody competed with the first antibody, no, single, no signal will be detected as it would have been washed away. On the other hand, if the antibody were not competing, first the primary antibody unlabeled will be uh, will bound to the spike protein and also the secondary, so the signal could be detected. And again, we tested these with uh, our monoclonal antibodies, and they could be again divided into the four groups, as you can see here, where antibodies in, in gray are those that do not compete, while the peaks in blue are the antibodies that compete among themselves, uh, among each other. Sorry. And so we could produce uh, a heat map, as you can see here, where uh, RBD direct, S1 RBD directed antibodies are this um, uh, square here on top of, of the heat map. And as you can see, they show a very similar competition profile. Then the second group are an antibody directed toward the S1, but not the RBD. And these again show a very similar binding competition profile. The third group was antibody directed towards the, sp the spike pro protein in its trimary conformation. And they also share the same binding profile, competition profile. And finally, the antibodies directed towards the S2, which competed only against themselves, as you can see here. If we link this heat map to the neutralization 
data, you can see that basically our antibody that recognize four different regions on the surface of the spike protein can be listed as most potently neutralizing, which, is the, which are the S1 RPD, followed by the S1 antibody, S protein trimer, and S, and those that are specific for the S2. Then we took uh, three of the best candidates that we have now ranked in terms of extreme potency, and we engineered in order to ex the RFC portion, sorry, in order to extend their half-life and to abrogate the FC gamma receptor binding. And then we assessed again whether this antibody maintained their binding specificity towards the spike protein. And as you can see in the, in the, in the top graph, they all bind the spike, the spike trimer. In the middle, you see the binding specificity towards the S1 domain, and none of them were able to bind the S2 domain. And we again assess their, their, their functionality, so the neutralization ability of binding, the neutralization towards the wild type strain of one, and then the strain D614G. And as you can see, they show extreme potent uh, neutralization uh, potency with an IC9, an IC100 for the wild type strain of less than uh, of less than uh, five nanograms for two for two of them, and only one of them was a little bit above the ten nanograms. So to conclude, uh, our MAD lab, the MAD lab aims to fight antimicrobial resistant bacteria and with new technologies, try to bring the uh, microbiology field into the 21st century. Uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemics, there has been a huge effort in our lab, we, uh, which grew exponentially to fight this pandemic and produce the data that I just showed you. Over 420, uh, over 4,200 memory B cells were single cell sort sorted and 1,700 were specific for the spike protein. And we identified 453 neutralizing antibodies and only 1% of these were actually extremely potently neutralizing. We identify also four different regions on the surface of the spike protein, uh, four different neutralizing regions on the surface of the spike protein. And we took the three most promising antibody, engineered them and showed extremely potency against both the wild type and and, and word spread the 614 G strain. Obviously, plenty of people have been involved in, in this project. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for sure the whole Mad Lab COVID-19 team, the TLS, Achilles Vaccines, and all of uh, our collaborators and uh, Spallanzani, Siena, and I mean, uh, everywhere, all of our collaborators. And obviously all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Andriana, for your presentation. I, it's fascinating to see what's going on and the speed at which this all came together is really impressive. Thank you, Sabrina. So we're getting some questions from our audience members, so I'll dive right in. Um, let's see. Well, one of the big, the big items in the news, I kind of figured someone would ask about this. Um, President Trump received some antibody cocktails from Regeneron and he suggested that this cured him. There's no way to know, of course, if this is true. It begs the question, in this environment of pandemic, panic, and, and all of these kitchen sink approaches, how, how can we measure the efficacy of these monoclonal antibody therapies in a real world setting? Could you comment on that, please? Sure. Well, now there are currently uh, different trials. There are general one, which are the antibody cocktail that uh, the, uh, Trump received, the President Trump received, as well the Ali Lilly also they are trying with uh, antibody cocktails. Uh, and they are ready to release some of the uh, preliminary data of their clinical trials, and they are showed that to be efficacious. But to be fair, uh, I think the monoclonal antibodies are a great therapeutic tool, and they've shown the great potential, not only in the infectious disease, which are now their gaining field, but also in the, if you think about immune oncology and all the other fields, monoclonal antibody do work, they are safe, they can be quickly developed, as we have seen. The pandemic started uh, February, March, and now we already have plenty of monoclonal antibodies in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in clinics and they are, they are working well. So we are confident that in the real world, they, they can be very well translated. Okay, great. And in terms of, of measuring their efficacy in the real world population, you're confident that we can actually run an experiment that will give us the efficacy result? Well, they're they not gonna move to uh, the phase three, right? Where they're gonna have a lot, uh, thousands of, patients to which uh, give prophylactically or therapeutically the monoclonal antibodies and mm. assume that they will be released and 
uh, we will know for sure whether they were they will be efficacious or not. But again, I'm extremely confident of their uh, potential. Great. Oh yeah, the potential is really exciting, and it's good mm -hmm. to see it moving quickly. So that's great. Okay, questions about the correlation of frequency of the COVID specific antibodies. Uh, the number of patients wasn't huge, but did you notice any correlation of frequency of the antibodies with the severity of the patient's disease? Well, to be fair, when, when you do this kind of workflow and you single cell sort memory B cells, it, there's a lot of going on also in terms of techni technicality. Uh, mm -hmm. Some patient can, be, uh, can stay well, other where they have more severe infections and whenever you collect the PBMCs and you perform the single cell sorting on the memory B cell, the state of the cells themselves can influence the overall workflow. Uh, we didn't observe any specific kind of uh, correlation in terms of severity. Some of the antibodies that were very potent uh, did not even get any um, medication, they just went home and still managed to produce some very good neutralizing antibodies. So that's, that's, uh, there, there's huge variability. Yeah. Um, similar, I think this is the same question, the level of correlation between neutralizing antibody production and patient outcome that's sort of related. Well, again, some of the, and of course, if there, if there has been a more severe infection, the possibility to fight antibodies or a little bit more of maturation. If you've got a severe infection, the viral tether will be higher, which means the memory B cells will have the time, a little bit more time to properly maturate or to recognize more functional, let's say, epitopes on the surface of the spike protein. And then in turn, you will find more antibodies that are functional. But at the same time, here is a, a matter of finding the little antibody that, that works. And this can be produced by a, a person that has been with, had a severe infection as well as a, somebody with a more mild uh, infection. They are very rare. There's just, as we showed you, there's just a 1% of them and they can be produced by everybody. Wow. Yeah. It's so sort of a needle in the haystack situation. Yeah, exa <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and with this, uh, we are <laughs> actually quite sure that these antibodies, the extremely potent neutralizing antibodies are not those that uh, give you the overall polyclonal antibody response. They are not responsible for neutralization titer observed in the sera because mm -hmm. they are so few. There are tons of other, as we showed you, region that can be recognized by neutralizing antibodies. And they are, there's plenty of those and possibly those are the ones responsible for your polyclonal response, your serum titer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it looks like, so since RBD specific antibodies seem to be the most potent, that was a um, supposition, should vaccines express RBD rather than a full spike? We've had this question on other webinars before, and I think it's still sort of unknown, but what do you think? Well, if you're able to um, stabilize the RBD in a manner that exposes uh, the, the right epitopes, for uh, eliciting neutralizing antibodies, then yes. But that's a, danger, a dangerous game because if you start using just very small portion of the antigen, then you might in some case elicit escape, um, the possibility to, of escape mutants as well. Uh, mm -hmm. While if you go with a whole protein like the spike protein per se, uh, you will be able to elicit antibodies that are potently neutralizing as well as multiple other antibodies. And it would be way more difficult to produce, to, to select escape mutants. So, you know, it's a, it's a balanced game. Uh, it has to be carefully uh, taken into account. Yeah, and that sort of relates to a question we just received about um, driving escape. How many doses do you think will be required and do you worry about driving escape? Well, uh, to be fair, this is some, uh, something that we are uh, currently working on. Uh, we didn't want, well, I mean, we didn't have the whole set of data to show it to you today. Sure. Uh, but uh, there, there has been one uh, paper released at the very beginning, probably was May, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. uh, from the Regeneron guys. And they showed that with the pseudotype, it was very quickly, they, they managed to quickly produce uh, escape mutants. We mm -hmm. are doing this and it's very, it's actually very difficult to produce escape mutants. It seems like mm -hmm. in the lab, it is quite difficult to produce escape, um, escape mutants. Uh, and the coronavirus is, proper, is um, the only RNA virus uh, with a RNA polymerase pr proof reading. So possibly, and, and it has the largest genome, so possibly this helps to maintain uh, 
you know, the, the, the spike protein as it is, or just making few variations. But it, it is quite difficult to make it in the lab. And we have extensive, they are, now we are talking about two months of co-incubation between the antibody and the, the COVID, uh, the wow. SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, I mean, it's a work in progress, but it's, it's sure. a, it, I mean, they, they, we did, with the Regeneron data as well, I think, was it, no, Ellie Lilly, sorry. Uh, they also seen some increase of escape mutant with their cocktail, a little bit of increase, if I remember correctly. Mm. Uh, but I mean, we, we will see. We will see. see. Yeah. Okay. So questions about the neutralization for the monoclonal antibodies that only partially neutralize, such as the S2 specific, did any of them increase ADE? We try, uh, to be fair, we tried ADE. Uh, I don't think anybody has been able to properly show ADE with the monoclonal antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. uh, and we did not see it either. Uh, we are working on it as well, but so far uh, we didn't manage. It is very difficult to have a positive control if you never seen ADE with the SARS-CoV-2. So you don't mm -hmm. know if it's not working because the setting of your experiment is not right, or because actually you don't see it. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't exist. Okay, that's interesting. I always forget there are limitations with these types of experimental designs where you may yeah. not have the proper comparator. That may just be a limitation at first. Yes. Okay, is there any data on how long the monoclonal antibodies are effective in humans? So I think this is a question about duration. Well, um, a monoclonal antibody usually stands for roughly 21 days and then it gets degraded. And that's why we got the half-life extension. Uh, there is a monoclonal antibody for RSV that has been now shown uh, to be effective, a single dose, and they've they introduced this half-life extension in order to cover the whole uh, uh, seasonal period for RSV infection. Uh, and this can extend between three months, six months, something like that. So that will be the aim with our uh, mutations. Okay, great. Um, now some questions about the data. Do you have uh, in vivo animal data or human data that you can share with us today or just comment on if the data isn't um, in your slides? Uh, uh, I can say the data are promising. <laughs> uh, they look good, uh, both prophylactically and therapeutically. But again, uh, we don't have the complete data set to show you today. So. You guys are going to have to wait and tune in <laughs> for a later a session. A little bit more, a little bit more. Okay. And if you have any papers that are coming out, we're getting a couple of requests for, for publications on this. Um, aside from the preprint that came out, feel free to send that to us and we can send it out to the, the audience. We're happy to, to share that data when it's available. I will, Sabrina. No problem. Great. Okay. In a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies, how many are suggested to be mixed and how is that determined? Well, first of all, you have to find two monoclonal antibodies that do not compete with each other, right? So to good neutralizing antibodies, as we show you, uh, the most potent one are against the RPD. There's also other regions where they can combine on the under, uh, RPD, but then some of them are, well, let's say less moderate uh, ne neutralizers. I don't think it is a matter of how many you can put in a cocktail because technically in vitro, you can put as many as you want. The problem will be the production uh, and the scale up if you think about making more monoclonal antibodies in the development pipeline and then to combine them and then to give them, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to produce a mm. lot of them uh, rather than having a good one that works fine and you can go straight away with that one. And you will have big uh, biofermenters uh, yeah. <laughs> to make them available worldwide. So if you have one that works and they don't give you escape mutant, uh, probably will be quicker to go with one rather than making cocktails. Mm -hmm. And for this type of um, for this type of cocktail and approach, do you, are there manufacturing facilities that you're accessing in Siena? Does this get how does the manufacturing happen? I think that's a question that a lot of people have on their minds for this type of approach. <laughs> They, they are the manufacturer are in Italy. Yes, they are not uh, based. Uh, they're not based in Siena, uh, and and we we are now starting with a production part. And I mean, it, it will take a little bit of time, but we are pushing it a lot. There was also a paper where uh, a manuscript that came out, uh, I think, it was June. Uh, basically, now it is possible to do a huge speed up. If the world needs it, you should try to chop off all that is unneeded. Uh, 
but keeping obviously as a first thing in mind the safety of the sure. product itself but still you can definitely accelerate but you have to work synergically with regulatory uh, as well as develop developers to make it happen otherwise it will be all useless and that's what we are currently doing we are working in parallel regulatory part developers and trying to speed up as much as possible that's great yeah there seems to be that kind of theme across the field even you know, on the vaccine side that synergistic approach is really important and critical Absolutely. to, to speed otherwise up. It, it's useless you speed up you chop off stuff then the regulatory ask you for address say and then you have you will have to go back and it takes months to do one thing in gmp it's not like you go back in the lab and just do it quickly well right take. yeah <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we've got a question on the native antibody response. If a patient is treated with the monoclonal antibody, what native antibody response to the natural infection is expected? And there's a part two to that question. Would you think that such a treated patient would develop any protection upon a second exposure to this coronavirus after such a treatment? Well, if you receive a monoclonal antibody, even if it has extended half-life and, and, and last lungs, in uh, in the patients, mm -hmm. obviously once it is waved off, you can be re-exposed. You a monoclonal antibody is a passive prophylaxis approach or therapeutic approach, so your immune system will not be stimulated to develop monoclonal antibodies. And mm -hmm. for these, you will need the vaccine, and that's why both monoclonal antibody and vaccine will work synergically. The one does not exclude the other, but they have to work together. Uh, so once the uh, therapeutic, the, the monoclonal will be waived, obviously the, the person can be ex uh, is at risk of infection. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, is the epitope recognized by the monoclonal antibody stable, or have you seen a strain to strain variation? If the epitope recognized by our monoclonals is stable, well, yes, the the the. The, 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 the epitope recognized, the antibody may have some flexibility, but the epitope recognized is, uh, is, is well exposed and the antibodies can bind it like no problem. Okay. Is variation typically a, a concern for monoclonal antibodies if you're gonna use them as a therapeutic? Does that happen? <laughs> the flexibility, I mean, once they bound, obviously you're gonna have hanging in there, the other fab, as well as the, the constant region as well. But I mean, the flexibility, once they are bound, the, I didn't show it today, but it is shown in the preprint, the affinity of our antibodies is extreme. So once they bind, they bind. Great. And do you think antibodies against the nucleus side, the nucleocapsid would offer any therapeutic benefit? It's difficult to use. Um, if you think a uh, Byron, you will have your virin, which expose all the protein on the surface and the nucleocapsid will be internally expressed. So mm -hmm. if you want to block the, express, you will, the ingress of the virus within the cell, then an antibody towards the nucleocapsid will be uh, not, very, not very useful. But mm -hmm. if you think of targeting infectious cell, it might be that then some nucleocapsid antigen can be released and then antibody can but what we want to do is to avoid that the virus enters the cells first. And if they've done that already, then to quickly destroy all the virus. So that's why we, want, we went for the spike protein as all the other uh, that are working on this. Okay, great. So a couple of technical questions now. Um, do your potent neutralizers come from severe cases? Are they in the VH3-53 family? I'm not quite sure what that is. If you could <laughs> clarify that one for us. <laughs> so not all of them, as I said previously, not all of them come from severe infected patients. Some of them were very mild or they didn't even be, they haven't been even hospitalized. So they just went home, stay home and stay safe and uh, they still managed to produce some good neutralizing antibodies. Uh, as for the repertoire, if we talk about the gene usage, some of these antibodies, yes, are with the IGHB 353, but not all of them. Uh, and they also, among the 353, they accommodate different J regions, uh, sorry, J genes, and they do not use always the same and accommodate also different light chains. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very variable. Okay. And a couple more technical questions. I'm gonna read these directly. <laughs> um, after the culture of the single B cells, how do you proceed further? 
Um, one of the attendees commented they're using a protocol by Tiller et al. and have not had success with RT-PCR. Is there any other method they can try? Well, uh, so if we are talking about the uh, maintenance, uh, so for the two weeks incubation, we use the protocol for Wang et al. Uh, 2010 is nature uh, methodology. Uh, and it worked very well. Your cells are very well. Uh, the, the, the memory B cell, single, the single cell sort of memory B cell stay well. And we had a very high efficiency of 40 to 50%. Uh, if, you're, if we're talking about the recovery of the amplicons or the heavy and light chain genes, then yes, uh, we are very familiar with the Tiller one. So uh, they had the Waderman lab, uh, the, the, the work that they have done. And we used, yes, uh, those kind of primer sets. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is very important is your lysate because when will you, after the two weeks incubation, you will have to transfer quickly your supernates and into another well, uh, sorry, into another uh, plate, keep them in ice because the mRNA will be quickly degraded. And if they, and if it does, then you won't be able to recover any of your um, uh, heavy or light chain amplicons. So quick, mm -hmm. keep them in ice, uh, put quickly a lysis buffer and store it straight to minor ZD and then you can work with it. Okay, great. I think the same person also commented that the protocol was for the single B cells and they're putting their cells in culture for 13 to 14 days. So it sounds like maybe you're transferring your cells more frequently than that? No, no, no. Then, we just keep them okay. for two weeks. 14 days. At the 14th day, we just transfer into another, into okay. another plate, our supernatant, put the lysis buffer, and then quickly store it in minor 80. And the supernatant is fine. Antibodies are very stable, so you can keep them uh, in your fridge for some times and do all the tests and then put them back in the freezer. Okay, great. I hope that answered your question. If, uh, if you have more technical questions, feel free to ask. This is definitely what this lab meeting is for. We want yeah. it to be like a PI meeting with, you know, the lab <laughs> team. So feel free to send those. I'm just going to read them directly. <laughs> so thank you for sending your questions, guys. Um, now looking back to the, the cohorts, did you look for latency of SARS-CoV-2 in patients? No, to be fair, when we started in Italy, there were, there were just three cases. And they were all in the Spallanzani, which is the national issue of uh, infectious disease in Italy. Yeah. They were all there. So we took the very first three that we had uh, uh, here in Italy uh, and started working with it. And then everything that came after was just trying to get as quickly as possible other patients. So we didn't pay any attention on when the onset of the infection or the severity or for how long they were infected. So we just took all of them as quick as possible to start working on them. Okay, great. And have you seen any specific binding to the NTD region of the spike in your neutralizing antibodies? Well, that's what I think the S1 that do not bind the RBD are directed to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the S1 per se is made by the RBD here, then there is the C, the C terminal domain one, two at the NTD. So possibly they will bind the NTD. And I don't know about if there are antibodies towards the C terminus. Uh, as well, but um, I, I assume they will bind the entity, but we are not sure until we get the structure done. Okay, gotcha. All right, so now some questions on the manufacturing and the feasibility of the, the approach. Is there an estimated cost per dose for these monoclonal antibodies? Uh, well, it really does depend on the dose that you were gonna use, right? Mm. So if we wanna go uh, with uh, five, seven, 10 grams per dose, then you will have a huge manufacturing implant to make them a million of doses. If you want to go with, a, if your antibody is potent enough and allows you to reduce the dosage per patient, then obviously your manufacturer will allow you to implant, will allow you to produce way more doses and your cost of goods will decrease. Mm -hmm. It really does depend on your monoclonal. Okay, I think you know there there are implications for LMICs and and for low resource countries. If this would be a suitable approach, um, are there any ways to to make it more um, cost efficient for those countries? And you know, if you make larger batches, are there are, do the costs reduce? Is, would that be a potential approach? So I strongly uh, invite you to read the the, the new preprint that just get, got out. Uh, we talk about this as well uh, in the discussion. So we are obviously thinking to use our monoclonals worldwide. It doesn't have to be something just for high income countries, but it has to be available also for the low middle income country settings. 
So while our approach will be to try to use this very potent, the extremely potent neutralizing antibodies at a dosage that allows a very low cost, uh, very low cost uh, uh, per single dose, so that it can be used worldwide. And instead, instead of going for intramuscular, uh, sorry, instead of going intravenous. Uh, as they are currently doing in, in most of the trials that are out there, uh, which requires grams of monoclonal antibody, we will try mm. to go with uh, a, a IM or subcutaneous in, intervention. And this will allow us to reduce the dose and to make it more affordable in all countries. Great. Well, that's good to hear and, and check out that paper if you guys haven't seen it yet. Sounds like that's addressed in the discussion, so that's super. Um, okay, super neutralizing monoclonal antibodies could be beneficial because the necessary dose is smaller than usual, but is this benefit really essential or is a high affinity not as good as a super high affinity when it comes to efficiency and functionality? Well, as I just said, if you've got a very potent monoclonal antibodies, then you can reduce the dose. If you can reduce the dose, you can make your therapeutic or prophylactic tool available worldwide instead of having that just for high income countries. So that's gonna be the first thing. In terms of affinity and uh, functionality, um, most of the cases affinity do, do correlate with uh, functionality as well. It's not always the case though, because it depends also what the antibody does uh, when it binds, if there mm -hmm. are other factors involved or not. Uh, but yes, uh, we had a very great, with these three candidates that we selected, we had very high affinity as well, as very high functionality. So we're not worried about this. Um, okay, now question, do you have any cross neutralizers against SARS-CoV, uh, all the SARS uh, coronaviruses or MERS-CoV? Uh, we tested that, but just with pseudotyped. Uh, and so far, a bit, uh, we didn't manage to see any cross neutralizers. Uh, as you've seen, we have plenty. We just started with a, a, a small subset. Uh, we're just uh, we just started the search for them. Great. Okay. Do these monoclonal antibodies induce resistant mutations when the sublethal dose is used in vitro? It's an interesting uh, question. Well, that's again with the, with the escape mutants. So mm -hmm. we have used very high dosage. So we wanted to push the system, right? We wanted to select the escape mutant. We wanted to make the, the escape mutant. That's what we, we are working on. Uh, and it, it, it took like uh, roughly two months and we are now starting to see something. Something appears, the data again are preliminary. We have to double check, we have to be sure. Uh, but you don't want to use suboptimal. You want to push your system. You want to use, <laughs> you want to make sure that the uh, virus has to select an escape in order to survive. And that's mm -hmm. what we are doing and we will see. Okay, great. And have you va evaluated vaccinal effects of monoclonal antibodies, i.e. the emergence of antigen specific T or B cells? Say, say it again, Sabrina, sorry. Can you repeat the question? So I think the question is, have you evaluated like vaccine effects of monoclonal antibodies? So the emergence of antigen specific T or B cells? No, we, di we didn't. It will be very interesting. I mean, now all the works have been done on uh, convalescent donors, uh, people that survived mm -hmm. the infection. Uh, it will be very, very interesting then to see what happens following vaccination, especially because now there's all of these experimental vaccines, the Moderna one, uh, the Oxford one, the AstraZeneca Oxford one, they are all experimental and it will be very interesting to see uh, the kind of uh, immune response that they elicit, but we didn't. Okay, and do you envisage that the monoclonal antibody could be used as effectively among asymptomatic individuals compared to patients? can be used for, sorry, Sabrina? If it can be used effectively for asymptomatic individuals compared oh, yes. to, I'm, I'm assuming symptomatic patients. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the plan, uh, our plan is to use it for uh, everybody, especially for uh, healthcare workers uh, mm -hmm. and also for asymptomatic, absolutely. Healthcare workers, they are the most at risk since they are facing uh, people that are infected. So you can use, to, uh, you can give to them prophylactically and asymptomatic, then you will need to start and give the antibody to everybody because unless they screen themselves, then you, you are not able to do so. But if the cost of goods are very good and the dosage required is very low, then you can really start to give it uh, 
uh, to, a, to the broader population. Mm -hmm. Great. And that sort of relates to, you know, the application of, of these antibodies to different populations. You know, the elderly are often more affected. They have more severe disease and, and suffer um, more severe symptoms from COVID-19. What are the implications of using monoclonal antibodies for the elderly? So over 65, let's say, are there different, um, different expectations and, and different outcomes from using this for the elderly? I think it depends on what your antibody has to do. So if the aim of the antibody is just to bind the block in between the um, virus and the targeted cells, so that no effector functions is taken into account, then it doesn't really matter because mm -hmm. it is a passive prophylaxis or therapy. So as long as the antibody blocks the ingress of the virus within the host cells, you're fine. But if you rely on ADCC or other kind of functions based on the FC portion of the antibody, then it's a different story. Of course, the elderly mm -hmm. will be, uh, let's say they, they will have a dampened immune, immune system. So it will be less efficacious. But uh, if you're just aiming for the blocking, then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how it is the immune system around. Okay, great. Um, did you use other antigens besides spike in the screen? And if no, how, how come? Were there reasons they were not included in the screen? Well, we did not. Uh, here it was a, a race, right? You, you wanted to find as quickly as possible something that worked. And it was shown that the antibodies against the spike protein was the most promising. And we went straight for it. And it wasn't really the time to play around during this pandemic. Sure. <laughs> At that point, sure. it would be super <laughs> interesting to find antibodies against all the other antigens as well. Yeah, it'll be curious to see how, how many other experiments are done once we have a little more time and it's yeah, not exactly. in like a pandemic setting, what else can be done and what else we'll learn uh, in exactly. the future. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, we were a very uh, small group and we grew while uh, the process of the project was going on. So mm -hmm. we started, we went straight, head down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay. All right. A couple more technical questions. <laughs> Do you lyse your cells from wells directly in five microliter lysis buffer and store them at minus 80? Uh, and any protocol for thawing, do you heat them for lysis? No, definitely we don't need. So uh, we use 20 microliters. Uh, I mean, if we need more technical question, I think Sabrina, you can, you can definitely share my email and they can send it to me. Okay. It will be easier to discuss protocols. <laughs> Uh, uh, we use a 20 microliters lysis buffer and then we store it straight. We try to defrost it uh, gently. We, we don't want to, again, ruin the single strain, single strand of uh, mRNA. So don't, don't, don't overeat it. Otherwise, you're going to degrade the mRNA. We won't be able to recover anything. So don't heat yourselves. What we're saying. <laughs> Take home point of the day. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any concern about generating pathological immune complexes in the lungs in these monoclonal antibody therapeutics? <laughs> Say it again, Sabrina, sorry. So I think this is a safety question. Is there concern about generating a pathological immune complex in the lung using a monoclonal antibody? Well, um, I, I mean, I never, I never thought about it, but I don't know. I, I don't think that there's going to be any kind of uh, immunological complex that will be formed in the lungs, so that will exacerbate the infection. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been seen before with monoclonal antibodies, if that's been a concern. I don't, I don't think so. Also because uh, it has to be seen also, it has to be seen, the amount that of antibody that will reach the lung. Uh, it's not like all the antibodies can cross uh, um, can go cross tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, they they can go definitely, but the amount is not very very much known. And if they reach there, uh, I don't think they're gonna make any any complex that exacerbate the infection. To be fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, so we're almost at the end of the hour. Are there any final points or final thoughts you'd like to leave the group with, or? What is your, your dream experiment? What would you need to conduct your next series of, of dream experiments? Well, well, right now the dream is to bring these monoclonal antibodies out there. So that's a lot of our energy is going in there. Uh, fi finalizing our uh, uh, experiments so that we can go out with uh, 
the final manuscript and in parallel keep going with the development so that we can have a, a monoclonal antibodies to use as quick as possible. Absolutely. Well, we wish you the best of luck. I know it's a ton of work and requiring all of your focus in the lab, but we really appreciate everything you're doing and it'll be exciting to see what comes next. I think there's a lot, there's a lot coming down the pike in this field. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to share a couple of more slides just to wrap up. Bear with me. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Andriano, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. We know you're quite busy and we really appreciate your time uh, to, to speak with our audience today. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for the audience members for attending, asking your questions. We really, the dialogue is really useful for all of us in the field. So thank you for joining and sending in your questions today. I invite you to join us three weeks from today on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting, which is being rescheduled on October 29th at 10 a.m. Eastern time to accommodate for the FDA meeting on the 22nd. Our next speaker will be Dr. David Cordy from Beer Biotechnologies, who will talk about the potent neutralization of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV uh, pseudoviruses using the monoclonal antibody S309. Um, so please take a look later today. We're gonna send you an updated invite and just make sure not joining in two weeks, but three weeks from today, and then we'll resume our regular schedule. If you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID report. In this newsletter, we present insights from experts all around the globe and highlight the latest scientific articles and data. And lastly, please feel free to visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where we will upload a recording of this webinar for you to review. And with that, I will say thank you again for joining. Stay safe, get your flu shots, and uh, we hope that you'll join us in the next Global COVID Lab meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Dabney. Thanks, Manuel.